Welcome to this webinar today, focusing on fostering play and friendship skills in young children with autism, especially when they are in inclusive settings. Again, welcome to this AbleNet webinar, and let's learn together and gain more knowledge about how we can promote this important outcome for children with autism spectrum disorder. What are we going to be focusing on today? We are going to be work, uh, learning or gaining awareness, increased awareness about the importance of promoting uh, friendship skills, promoting child-to-child uh, -child engagement. In other words, children with autism engaging with their peers in the inclusive settings. How do we promote social interactions in these children? Because while we may not be constantly thinking about social interaction, it's a critical need. From my conversations with both teachers and families, I have found that if we don't nurture these, if we don't focus on this outcome in the early years, it becomes very difficult for these children, especially when they become teens or when they are adults, to establish any kind of friendships with uh, individuals, uh, other individuals, or engage in social interactions with others. So how can we use the usual classroom routines and the classroom instructional activities as opportunities so that we can facilitate this friendship and social skills? And I strongly believe it is important to use evidence-based strategies in order to promote these friendship, friendship skills. So we will focus on how do we use video modeling and evidence-based strategies, peer mentoring, prompting strategies, and providing optimal, not too much, not too little, just optimal paraeducator support in order to influence and facilitate this social engagement and friendship skills for children with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, what expertise do I bring to this topic? Uh, I'm an author of multiple books. I have a book on autism as well as a quick reference guide as well as several products that focus on early childhood education as well as uh, children with severe and multiple disabilities. So what are some of those characteristics, the distinctive and unique characteristics that children with autism spectrum disorders have that impact their friendship skills? How does it impact? Why do they face difficulties in learning how to play? and how to socialize with peers. One of the important things is the social emotional reciprocity. Do they pay attention? Do they focus on the nonverbal communication? Do they know how to engage in appropriate play? Do they know how to pay uh, joint attention to a, either a topic of discussion or joint interest in something uh, children not playing with. These are some issues that they have. Do they know how to spontaneously imitate other children? They are playing, let's say, in the house center or the dramatic play center, and the other children are pretending that they are having a little top tea party, and they are drinking tea in that little tea party that they are having there. Do children with autism know how to imitate that behavior. They usually have difficulty with that. And do they know how to invite another child into their play? Do they spontaneously share? They have difficulty with that, joy and interest. And in kind of initiating and making sure they have a strong peer relationship, they have friendship, do they interpret and convey their social communication cues? Um, do they pursue 
uh, varied and imaginative play that is appropriate for that age level, a developmental level. These are all some questions we need to ask because these are the areas that children with autism spectrum disorders have difficulty with. And it's important through intensive and intentional instructional activities and interventions, we need to address that so that children with autism spectrum disorders will engage in friendship and play and social communication, which will help them throughout their school years, and it will also impact how others perceive them. So, did I? Um, one of the major challenges that children with autism spectrum disorder, ASD, have social, emotional, and communication challenges. We all talk about how they have maybe difficulty with making eye contact, but that's not as critical, which that is an important factor. However, do they know how to read the body language of others? Do they know how others are feeling and reading and interpreting interpreting how others feel, especially when someone is upset or when someone is sad, do they know how to engage in that emotional reciprocity? The next one, do they know how to follow rules of conversation? That's another area they experience difficulty with. And that is when they are engaged in a conversation, it requires that they know when to stop that conversation, when to continue with that conversation, and making sure that the others in that group, they have to be able to gauge if others are interested in that topic, and they should know when to stop talking on that subject matter. That is the rules of conversation. One of the difficulties they have is following that. The other one, just like reading body language, is reading facial expressions of others. If somebody looks like they are in pain, or if somebody looks like they are sad, or somebody looks like they are upset, do they know how to read that person's facial expression and their minds and to be able to interpret that? Uh, if somebody is talking about something sad that happened to them, like maybe a pet is sick or pet is uh, pet has passed away, do they know to empathize immediately and understand it from the facial expression of their peer? Do they understand and grasp the hidden meaning of words? Or do they understand the literal meaning of words? And that's another area of uh, deficit for children with autism. And they certainly don't understand sarcasm usually because it has an implied meaning and when somebody is making a sarcastic remark and that uh, will impact their communication and social interaction. And also they don't know how to share their joy and interest and kind of uh, pull in a peer to share that joy with them. And this is all important that we take for granted, but these are things that we need to deliberately teach and intensively teach and intentionally teach in order to help children with autism to engage in appropriate communication and engagement with their peers. The, some of the barriers that impact interaction in inclusive settings is just because children with autism are included in a general education inclusive setting does not automatically give them the opportunity or give them the facility to engage with their peers. And this is particularly difficult, especially not only for children with autism, it actually it's quite challenging for children uh, with severe disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and children who have difficulty uh, with movement and they are using a wheelchair, it is much more difficult for them to engage in that spontaneous conversation. So we have to look at what are some environmental barriers that is coming in the way. 
or activities always promoting or limiting social interactions, or the centers that we have, especially in pre-K and kindergarten, maybe in, sex, in first, first and second grade as well, is it promoting individual play, like individual puzzles, individual paint easels, uh, individually focused toys, or is it promoting group play? So we have to look at that carefully. And the, others, the other couple of areas is children, their peers, peers of children with autism, don't know exactly how to initiate and to, how to coax and how to help children to engage in their play. So we have to coach their peers who may not have any uh, disability. Uh, they may have a mild disability, um, but we have to coach them, intentionally teach them how to engage with children with autism. And then there are other adult-related issues, and that is if we have especially um, paraeducators who are supporting individual children, we have to make sure they are not within kind of three feet of these children and they are circulating around and they are not continuously prompting them. They are not continuously uh, kind of promoting that dependence on the adult. So that is another barrier we have to overcome in order to enable and facilitate this friendship. And uh, there was an interesting study in this contest, context to look at. And this was published in 2017. This was a study that was done in Australia. And this study looked at perceptions of mainstream teachers, and they call special ed teachers, satellite teachers, uh, uh, special ed teachers and parents on the importance of friendship and uh, in comparison to other learning outcomes for children with ASD. Uh, Mainstream teachers, they had to both rate and rank these uh, friendship skills in comparison to academic outcomes, social skills, and uh, communication skills and all that. And they, what they found was they ranked friendship actually uh, less important than social, social skills and emotional development ranking in the ranking. They thought friendship, social, emotional development all were important. However, in their ranking, the friendship was ranked third. And quite often, we don't really think in terms of how do we promote friendship skills within that classroom. We don't always think about that. But later on, from my, as I said earlier, my conversations with parents, when they have teens and when they have young adults, their children with autism struggle to establish social connection, which causes a lot of problems, both when they are beginning to work in their workplace as well as when they are free t and during their free time. So the special ed teachers ranked core deficit areas, social skills, friendship, and emotional. Uh, they, they were higher priority. However, the mainstream teachers ranked intellectual and ac academic skills as higher priorities. That was kind of uh, comparison between mainstream. Mainstream teachers, they are just interested in getting their children to be involved in the academic activities, so naturally they didn't focus on that. And that's very, very important for us to know because we are talking about inclusive setting, and in that inclusive setting, if the mainstream teacher is the uh, general education teacher, she has to find ways to promote this friendship. And uh, also, the another important thing that uh, resulted from this study ranking was there was considerable disparity between teacher and parent perceptions of friendship as an important skill for these children. So it's, it's uh, something that we need to keep at the back of our mind when we are working with teachers as teacher trainers or when we are providing coaching to teachers or when we are looking at children in the classroom uh, as teachers, how do we promote that? So 
what are some benefits of play and interaction with peers for children with autism? It actually helps them learn many interrelated skills. As a matter of fact, if they developed higher levels of social skills and social competence, and they have meaningful friendship with their peers, then the possibilities of their behavior problems or the communication problems or their frustration issues due to communication problems is likely to be less because they are engaged, because they are engaged with their peers, they are focused on that task. And when they learn to communicate, this will help them to learn to communicate uh, their thoughts and their feelings, and some of the problems in group play would become uh, less, and they will learn how to negotiate and compromise. Let's say children are playing with blocks. Instead of going and taking the block away, they will learn how to negotiate and compromise so that they can play alongside them or play with them or enter into their play. And um, they will also learn you know, how to understand the feelings and perspectives of others, which is very, very important because as 90% uh, of our communication is through nonverbal language, only 10% through the spoken word. And, and they will also be able to work out some of their emotional conflicts and frustration and anxiety and the sensory overload they do experience. So is social competence attainable for children with autism spectrum disorders? Based on research, when we have systematically planned uh, opportunities for them, children with autism spectrum can learn the appropriate skills to initiate that positive interactions and build friendships. One of the things we need to do is to carefully look at our environment and how can we arrange that so that uh, we will increase that social interaction taking place in that inclusive setting. That's one of the first things, and that's one of the easiest, and it's the least intrusive. The other thing, how do we recruit willing partners and accepting partners so that they can help coach, they can practice the skills. Children with autism can practice the skills along, alongside children without any special needs, but we need to coach the, their peers without special needs in order to facilitate this to happen. And uh, one of the things I do mention, uh, want to mention at this point we do have a lot of children with ASD who use assistive technology devices. For example, one of the things that we can very easily do is to have peers who are able to communicate program that sitting next to a child with ASD, and they can program the device. They can say the words when the adult is maybe switching the buttons, the children, the, the peers of children with uh, AST can actually say the words. And that will make that connection between the two children. Uh, the other thing is we need to carefully choreograph that paraeducator or any other adult support. Instead of speaking for the child, the paraeducator can provide the visual cue to encourage the child to talk, child with ASD to talk, and to participate in social group. Instead of sitting next to the child and behind the child, the paraeducator can encourage a peer to do that back and forth communication. And the peer can actually use the visual cue and show it to the child instead of the paraeducator doing that. And it is important that we don't do it just during centers. We do it throughout the day, during circle time, during the outside play, during the time that we have games. Though so I do notice lately, we don't really engage children in kindergarten 
and maybe first grade or in pre-K, in that many group games. Uh, but that's extremely important. We have kind of somewhat dropped the idea of group games in preference for seating children in front of a com computer. And of course, children with autism, absolutely, many of them do thrive uh, working on the computer, but it doesn't necessarily encourage that social interaction. So we need to look at how do we plan our routine activities in the classroom. So what do we do with the, in terms of environmental arrangement for the classroom? Set up the environment so that it will increase interaction skills. What is one of the things that you do? Um, for example, when you are setting up centers, make sure your centers are set up not for individual activities, but much more either peer-to-peer -peer interaction activities or a small group activities. And so teach uh, children the social interaction throughout the day in a variety of activities. Uh, let's say you are doing story time, include some role play and drama and provide different uh, children the opportunity to stand next to the teacher and engage and call on different students and make sure the child with autism has more opportunities than the others in order to be feeling that they are very much a part of the group. Uh, one of the other things that you can do is a child with autism and another child, they can take turns in showing up showing pictures related to the story. Uh, you know, so they, one person shows one picture, another person shows, so they take turns, so they learn how to take turns and also to be the center stage. Uh, they can certainly do that during block play. Instead of having one child play with dogs, they always, and it is important that we provide the necessary scaffolds, necessary kind of cues, necessary kind of encouragement and prompting to engage in that two or three children working together in the black play. And the same thing can happen in housekeeping, dramatic play center, and uh, children with autism will ne definitely uh, need to be coaxed into joining that kind of small two, three children group play. Um, and as a matter of fact, I, I personally feel computer center should not even be really a center offered to uh, children because if they choose that, then it's just one-on-one, -on -one. unless it's a group activity that they uh, do it as a group activity. Uh, and also during recess, if there is playground equipment that will facilitate several children working together, uh, that's something that should be encouraged. Another thing is if a child with autism uh, can bring something to the playground and then everybody wants to take turns looking at it, participating, then that's another opportunity. We have to look for opportunities throughout the day. Uh, and of course, we have to be constantly aware and alert and provide uh, teaching uh, to children with autism how to play, how to interact, how to initiate. Though they do know, I think, how to initiate, at least that's what the research is saying, it's the way to appropriately interact. And then, uh, you know, uh, involve peers uh, without disabilities in peer-mediated intervention. Uh, how can they, inter you know, in initiate interaction? How do they call on the child with autism to come and join their play? Uh, how do they give attention to those children? How do they position themselves uh, to encourage that friendship and group play? So some of the other things uh, is like, for example, look at your classroom. When, uh, which classroom activities that are open and available? Which materials that are available to all children, particularly peer-to-peer -peer interaction? And think about group composition. Always include child with autism with a very competent peer so that they will uh, uh, you know, engage in that play. Uh, limit the number of centers so that it will kind of force the children to engage in group interaction. Um, 
And of course, as I said earlier, make sure children with good social skills are grouped with children with less uh, skills socially. Uh, some of the other things, like for example, when you're, the, immediately what comes to mind is a puzzle. A child with autism may naturally go, if the computer center is not available, they may want to play with puzzles. Assuming you do have puzzles, is there a way you can have a large floor puzzle where two, two or three children are working together to do the puzzle together? Another idea is to have wall murals where you cover up the wall and they work together painting on the wall instead of having the individual easels that only allow one child to work and there is no social interaction. Here they can paint, they can work together, they learn to cooperate, they may bump into each other, but they learn how. Another thing that I'm thinking of, every, every day children line up to go outside to play or they may go to the cafeteria and they line up if there is a way we can partner peers or peer partnering if we can do. And one another additional activity could be that the child with uh, autism can hold a card or a picture card or a number card or a color card and then he or she has to find another partner with that same color card, same picture card. And this will be a little bit of academic as well as friendship and also it will make that child with autism do some initiation to seek out somebody. Another one uh, is, uh, you know, replace individually used toys uh, with toys for group play, like uh, uh, replace sit and spin, replace small puzzles, replace painting easels with rocking board, giant floor puzzles, mural painting. And one of the other activities, let's say in kindergarten and first grade, if they're working on a writing activity, what you can do is you can um, uh, cover the table with paper and you have just read a story to them and they do their story illustration or they draw some pictures. Let's say they are talking about uh, zoo and uh, zoo animals or water animals. You know, they can uh, list some of the animals. They can, you know, we can allow some spelling errors, which is perfectly okay, as long as they work together and they kind of create a scene about that story. Or, uh, you know, things like that, that will bring them together. Or if you have water table and sand table, they are facing each other and it's always a group, not one individual side, child. Uh, so what are some key in interaction skills? What we want children with autism spectrum disorders to learn is skills for play entry. How do they enter play? If two children are playing with blocks, they are building something, and the child with autism also wants to play, how do we teach that child to go make that request if he or she could join that play? That is something we will definitely need to deliberately and intentionally teach. And then, after playing with them for a few seconds, you don't want that child to leave and go on to something else and move on and more. So we want them to engage in kind of sustained play for a short period of time, at least initially, and then gradually increase. How do we, that is how they maintain that play, and then they establish partnership and friendship and how they cooperate. So you teach all that systematically, uh, you know, during the block play or during uh, they are painting the mural uh, or they are uh, playing outside for recess. And, of course, sharing and cooperating goes along with that. Um, so what are some other things? You have to use especially the circle time uh, offers a great opportunity to role play and rehearsal. And also the housekeeping and the dramatic play center offers another opportunity to practice. Is 
how do I get my friend's attention? What do I do? Do I just go grab the book he's looking at in the book center? Or do I ask, how do I get his attention? Do I tap him on his back? Or do I call his name? These are things that we need to deliberately teach. How do I share objects? If I want to look at the same book, and the another child has a book that I want to look at, how do I ask? How do I share something? And if I find something very interesting in the picture that I'm looking at, how do I show it to my friend? And how do I get his interest into what I am looking at? And how do I ask my peers when they are playing with something to share their objects? How do I enter that play? How do I enter that conversation? And how do I initiate an idea for a play? How can we do this together? Oh, why don't we do have a little tea party? Why don't we dress up uh, like fairies? How, why don't we dress up like the animals in the zoo? How do we teach children? We have to think about how do we teach children with autism to initiate that kind of uh, idea to a friend? And also, how do I say something nice? Thank you. I really, oh, thank you for letting me join your play. Or uh, thank you for letting me play with the blocks. Thank you for letting me look at the book. How do we teach them to say something? Oh, did that hurt you when you fell down? Oh, let me rub that for you. Does it hurt? So it's kind of a role play. And we have to have lots of rehearsals. And it's not only going to help those children with autism spectrum disorder. It will help all children to develop empathy and also the right way to communicate with peers. So plan and design your activities that it will uh, support peer interactions. Look at your routine. One of the things that you many, many kindergarten classroom pre-K do have is the snack time. That's a great opportunity. Usually we have adults maybe passing. I think it is true that in some of the classroom I have seen uh, children passing out. And uh, sometimes children with autism also have the opportunity to pass out, but they may give themselves the snack and they may just sit, go and sit down. But we don't accept that and then we push that child, or in other words, encourage that child through our words to go and give the same thing to the others. So they have to kind of more or less make a little bit of eye contact, see that peer, and so they get to know and they get to work with the others. And they may gather book books. They may distribute the art materials. They may pass out the crayons and the markers when they are doing the wall mural. They may pass out the brushes. Uh, and make sure that you add certain steps so that that will deliberately promote those peer interactions. Uh, let's say uh, you are playing some musical uh, games, like a um, uh, variety of musical games you can play, especially if you're doing something like a music and movement type of thing, you can have children partner together, uh, they can dance together, they can uh, stand on the mat when the music stops, they have to find their mat, and they have two children holding hands standing on the mat. So in other words, they move around the mats in pairs, and that will kind of initiate that friendship. And then they play games they, that requires uh, partnering. And if they are working, let's say, if you do have used computer, make sure that it's kind of always two children or two or three children working together to engage in that whatever computer software that you are using that allows that to happen. Um, also, make it a point. If a child wants to go to the book center and has great interest in books, and this is, happens to be a child with ASD, encourage that child, why don't you go ask Brian to join you so that you can both look at the book together. So we have to make those kind of conversations and teaching and coaching uh, for children with autism. 
So peer mediated intervention, by the way, is an evidence based practice. So we teach socially competent children how to use incidental teaching uh, strategies with their peers. Uh, they, one of the things that's suggested in this research is the children who are higher functioning can actually keep track of, the, in other words, they put a little sticker, a happy face, or something like that on this chart every time they try to interact. So it's kind of teaching them actually how to collect data. So we are challenging them, but at the same time, it also provides an opportunity for my children with autism spectrum disorder to get engaged with the other peers. And instead of just having one or two children, train, train several peers to use this uh, incidental teaching opportunity. And then have peer buddies. In other words, when they are picking uh, uh, centers, make sure two or three children together are picking that center. So, and make sure that you change these peer buddies uh, regularly so that they are not always working with the same. And our children with autism learn how to work with a variety of uh, personalities. Um, and of course, as I said um, initially, it is extremely important that children with autism, when they are uh, using their assistive technology device and the programming is done by one of their peers. When I say programming, they, the peers, speak into the device, whether they are using a very simple single switch or something like a super talker with multiple icons, a child, a peer, can dictate, can say the word and record it. Uh, with the assistance, of course, of a, an adult. And many of these children will learn how to do it themselves once they have multiple opportunities for practice. And how do we, as I mentioned uh, before, we have to coach for social interaction. What are the steps involved? What can you do during your story time or circle time to teach these skills? Explain the skill, what you want. I want you to say hello to this person. I want you to ask him to sit next to you. So you have to deliberately identify the skill and teach that skill and then demonstrate. If you want to ask, if they are, let's say, passing out something, you have a puppet that's associated with the story and they are passing it around. Your child with autism spectrum disorder need to ask the person sitting, the peer sitting next to them, can I have a look at that puppet? And if they are not using words, they can, can they at least use gestures with their hands to ask, or can they use a picture, give me, or please give me. So, and you, as a teacher, you, or as a speech pathologist, Whoever is working with that child deliberately uh, demonstrate the correct way to do it. And then also show you cannot grab that puppet, you cannot grab that uh, book, and you also show what's not acceptable and what is acceptable. And let the child practice with an adult, and you may have to even do it in addition to the circle time, you may have to do it in a one-on-one -on -one session as well. And let the child also practice with another child. Um, you may not be able to do all of this at the same time. Even if you implement a few strategies, it will put that child on an upward trajectory for friendship and social skills. And provide positive feedback not the usual good job, but you know, I like the way you played with Brian using those blocks. You really cooperated. So emphasize what you want to see happen again and again. So what are some personalized, in addition to all these, there may be certain situations where you may have to, as I said, one of the personalized would be one-on-one -on -one teaching and the modeling and kind of additional verbal 
uh, cues and the visual cues that go with that uh, and teach that on a one-on-one -on -one session. And sometimes you may have to provide kind of physical assistance. When, what I mean by that is if the child is sitting away and going to the computer, you physically guide that child to go and play uh, with two other children at some other center uh, and provide specific feedback uh, when they are playing, engaging in group play, and make sure that you choose activities, preferably in the initial part, before the children learn how to engage. Uh, you want to make sure that you use centers or you use toys or you use those that are preferred by the child with autism, that the child has a strength in that area, uh, and then gradually move to the area of uh, you know, diverse uh, centers, which may be the ultimate uh, objective. Um, and you can combine this, actually, with behavior management, but it is not behavior management. When you promote that social interaction and the communication that goes with that, you would find the behavior management issues kind of get decreased. Um, what do we, the results of uh, another study uh, working on this uh, peer interaction and peer support intervention found that it led to a lot of substantive uh, increase in interaction. Actually, it increased interaction among all students, not just children with autism. Um, and it was also, the another interesting thing was, uh, this was a study uh, that the, possibly the report has just come out. I attended this session in 2018 CEC convention just very recently, and they found that they, it was viewed very positively by by both staff and students when this kind of intensive uh, interactions took place. Um, and um, the another thing that I want to look at and share with you is many of you, I'm sure, or most of you, if not all of you, uh, familiar with the social stories. Um, the Source of Stories by Carol Gray, that I found that website is no longer available. However, if you go to the autism internet modules, you will find what are called social narratives, and they use something very similar to social skills, uh, stories, social stories, and those are visually represented stories. And you can use that to teach specific social skills as well as friendship skills. In other words, if you want to play with others, how do you ask for that friendship? How do you promote that cooperation? You can put it in visual format and teach that. And how, if you grab a toy, how it would make the child who is holding that toy or who is building that block uh, tower unhappy and sad, whereas how do you ask you use social stories as a medium to teach the child. And it's, uh, you know, I have kind of shared with you just a couple of uh, pages from a social stories uh, or social narrative sample pages and uh, to teach social skills and cooperation and how to ask. Just like I said, rehearsal earlier on, this is using the medium of social narratives. Another one is prompting. As I mentioned earlier, it is extremely important that that prompting is optimal prompting, not over, overly intrusive. We do want to prompt children to engage in positive social interactions with their peers. Uh, for that, it is important that we are not sitting at their back but guiding them through a systematic process. For example, if you want to engage a child uh, with ASD in, uh, in socially interactive play, you want to begin with using high probability requests like call, touch your nose, touch your mouth, and then when they conform and they perform those actions, you move to a more difficult request like come here and you can play with Robert, you can play with him uh, at the block center, or you can play with him, or you can paint that mural with Susie 
So it kind of encourages that, but you do provide prompting. Um, and also, you can provide ideas for how to participate in social activities uh, before the play situation. You know, uh, do you want, who are you going to ask? Are you going to ask um, uh, uh, Brian here to help you with the puzzle so that both of you can do the puzzle together? So it's kind of uh, important that we encourage, prompt, and guide. Hopefully, uh, after repeated practice, they would themselves initiate and make that appropriate uh, communication. And so systematic prompting is another practice that suppose is promotes a positive social interaction and it does increase it. So um, when intervention is gradually faded and these increases occur rapidly and it can be maintained when that adult support is gradually faded away. Um, and also research suggests that this increases in the frequency of peer interactions, and there is also leads to greater acceptance by their peers of some of the uh, children with autism and their kind of uh, distinctive and unique characteristics. And I also want to mention at this point that encourage, if you're working with families, encourage them at, that they should pursue these kind of group opportunities and peer uh, interactions and group play uh, as soon as possible when the children are still young. Um, one of the things that I already mentioned is how um, the paraeducator support. You know, 400,000 paraeducators are employed to assist children with that. And many, many children with autism spectrum disorder often have either a one-on-one -on -one or Definitely in the inclusive setting, uh, a paraeducator who may be working with one or two students, and frequently they are sitting either right behind, uh, guiding, even moving their hands. And I have seen, even when they are using an assistive technology device, that they are kind of holding the child's hand and making the child access that tool. How about using peers instead? Uh, studies have in, uh, indicated that this presence of paraprofessional support, especially if you read this book by Theo Harris, she says based on considerable amount of research that was done, this leads to poor social outcomes for many children with autism spectrum disorder. It is important for us to remember that. Uh, because of proximity issues, over prompting from the adult, uh, it really impacts negatively the social interaction outcomes for children with autism. And one of the reasons is paraeducators receive very little formal training, especially in working with children with autism. So that's another area that, even though that's not the main focus, indirectly it impacts uh, the children with autism. So that's an important thing that school districts need to be alert and aware of. Uh, another technique that, that's also evidence-based is video modeling. In other words, you portray scenarios where children are asking for help, children asking to want to play, children saying cooperative, uh, children saying kind of nice things to their peers and want to engage in cooperative play. So the child with autism watches the video, that demonstrates the target behavior, and then the child imitates that behavior. So teach conversational skills, how to ask for help from a peer, how to ask to play, uh, how to engage uh, and communicate uh, spontaneous greeting, how to engage in play behavior, all this through video modeling. So what are some of the steps? Um, Create the video. These days, it's even simple using our smartphones. Uh, smart, uh, short, and very simple, clear steps. Focus on the desired behavior. Introduce the skills. And then work with a peer mentor. And then review the steps and show the video model to the student and to the peer mentor. 
and have the student practice it, asking the peer for something or giving the peer something or saying something to the peer. And then, you know, review the steps and practice it a few more times until the child gets quite familiar and competent in using those, uh, um, you know, using those skills. So finally, the most important thing that we need to do is to train the peers and teach the peers to be supportive and willing partners in engaging in peer interaction and friendship with children with autism spectrum disorder. And you may not want to focus on all of the behaviors. It may be play entry. You may pick on that. Uh, you may uh, pick on cooperatively working with another child uh, and not getting into grabbing things. So focus on the specific behaviors that is key to social interaction for that specific child. Gather data and see how the peer interaction is proceeding and monitor the in interventions that you are doing. Try one intervention at a time. Uh, but do that intervention in multiple locations, when they are in the cafeteria eating lunch or when they are in the playground playing. Do they request another child to come and play with them? Do they initiate a conversation? And uh, monitor for success. Provide cueing and visual cues work extremely well, of course, with children with autism. They have strengths in that area. Use those to help them to play together, share with their friends, and to be, be persistent in your pursuits. And use systematically scaffolding techniques and be consistent in your implementation. And of course, for generalization purposes, it is embedded throughout the day. And these are a number of uh, resources, references that you can go back to learn more on this topic. Uh, unfortunately, not I, in, from my perspective, I have not found that much emphasis on play and friendship skills. Uh, uh, the focus is much more on the behavior and the communication and the academic skills uh, for children with autism, but we do need to focus because when they get to their teens and the adults, this becomes a major impediment in their life success. There are a variety of web sources, resources as well. Autism Internet Module is one. And uh, there are a variety of uh, social narratives that are available through this place. And also uh, uh, the um, uh, What Works Briefs also has a number of very valuable resources. Um, as you know, April is Autism Awareness Month. Let us work together. Let us resolve to better understand children with autism spectrum disorder and guide them, coach them, teach them to engage with their peers and have fun playing and gaining friends so that it has a major impact on their life trajectory. I also want to thank AbleNet for hosting this webinar and making it possible for us all to learn together to work with children with autism. At this point, I want to mention a couple of more things. The next webinar that I will be presenting for AbleNet on May 8th will focus on behavior strategies. How do we avoid seclusion, timeout, and restraint? Hopefully, it's being used less and less. But uh, children with disabilities are indeed uh, facing a lot of uh, discipline-related uh, issues, uh, according to the data, uh, according to the statistics. So how do we prevent that behavior from escalation? So a variety of strategies and to prevent behavior escalation I will discuss at this webinar. I also want to mention that May happens to be a hearing and speech month. 
So there are some webinars that are offered by Head Start in collaboration. They are working Head Start and the Department of Special Education. They are called Coffee Break Webinars of 15 minutes in length. Uh, you may be able to search. Or the, uh, one of the collaborative agencies is ASHA. Um, so you may, many of you who are joining us today may be a speech pathologist, and you may have already heard about that. These are called Coffee Break Webinars, and it starts in May. And again, thank you, everyone, for attending this AbleNet webinar. Have a great day, and thank you, and thank you to AbleNet.